Initially, this was written to be presented to developers to kind of present them a different approach to getting music in their games because our production music libraries are here. They're here to stay. Uh, some might say they're taking our jobs, but I don't think production music libraries take the jobs of uh, good composers because uh, if it does your job as well as you, then, you know, why shouldn't people use it? So just a little background on myself. Uh, I started a company called Lee and Ortega with David Ortega, which, uh, who some of you may know. Um, together, we've uh, done a bunch of games, mostly in the casual and mobile space. Um, a lot of shovelware. <laughs> um, but, you know, for those games, it's very important to have a tight, tight uh, music briefing system and a way to kind of communicate with your contractors. So uh, we, over the years, we've kind of developed uh, a way that both of us agree on uh, in communication uh, between the client and the contractor. So this was meant for the for developers. Um, uh, what what I meant to say was that you know you could you could you could take music out of the game; it'd still be a game, right? Maybe it wouldn't be amazing, but it'll still be working. But it could be much, much worse if you put in crap music. Um, I think we can all agree on that. So first, let's talk a bit about music supervision. So in every other industry um, that requires music for production like TV, movies, music supervision is very, very commonplace. But very often in game audio, the role is taken over by the audio director who also has one million other things to do. And uh, <clears throat> it's I think it's high time that we start thinking about having someone on a team, especially if there's a lot of music that's going into a game, uh, to kind of uh, help the designers right, to prototype and develop an aesthetic for the game and also source the music uh, from music libraries, from contractors. So... You guys are probably all familiar with this, you know, disasters of poor music direction. You get poor instructions. You get endless revisions because they didn't know what they wanted or they didn't know how to communicate it in the first place. Uh, I have replaced an entire soundtrack before and, you know, basically they paid three times as much as they needed to in the first place as a result, right? And, um, of course, and one of the things that they don't really think about because, I mean, you just look, if you're just looking at the line items, right, you're going to say, oh, you know, the music doesn't actually cost that much. So it's okay if we spend a lot of time on it. But you have employee hours and every one of those people is being paid, right? They have an hourly wage. This adds up and this is not profitable. So there has to be a better way for game developers to communicate their needs with us, right? And one of the ways we can do this is with music prototyping. And there are repositories of thousands, thousands of well-organized, licensable pieces of music online that you can download and use for free uh, if you don't publish the game, right? If you're just testing it out in the studio, right? And this is a really, really good way of testing a large number of references to find out what you're really after. And if you fall in love with one of these tracks, it's not like you you used Highway to Hell from ACDC as a reference, right? You can actually license these things, and very often it's not very expensive, even though it's it's all non-exclusive for the most part. Why music production libraries? After the third iteration, right, uh, by any composer, and I at least speak from my own personal experience, when I am on my third revision, I know something is wrong. Right, because I, I I work mostly in. It's not like we're developing a completely new sound for a new kind of game, right? I mean, a lot of the stuff that I work on is casual, right? Match three or something that has a location. You know, it's China. They want it to sound Chinese, so they hire me. I'm from Singapore. There isn't a need for endless iteration. Usually, I um with good music direction, I've often got gone stuff first draft. It's in, right? So what production music libraries allow you to do is if you have a, an 
if you have a creative supervisor or a producer that's working with you to source the music, and they don't really know what they want yet, right? They shouldn't be engaging the composer yet. That's not they're, they're not ready, right? So by using production music libraries, right, they're able to prototype in the game use as temp tracks, right? Uh, tracks from these music production libraries and iterate and iterate and you can you can try so many different styles and you don't have to pay revision fees. So obviously we all are familiar with temp love, right? You know, when someone sends you a reference track that uh, they really like and then they say, can you make this sound as close to the track as possible without um, violating copyright? I always say yes and uh, I think I've been okay so far. Uh, but this is one of those, it's, it's one of those things that uh, can come if you have a person who is not a, a musical mind, so they get very attached to uh, a piece of music. They don't, they can't conceive of how it could be any different, right? So this is one, uh, this is one of the problems. Uh, another thing is that, you know, it's not written just for the game. In mobile games, I, I think, I'm of the opinion that, uh, music is very much a part of the branding, right? More than maybe even the storytelling, especially if you have a, a puzzle game, right? You just want something that gets into people's heads. They're familiar with it. They keep thinking about it. When they hear about it again, the familiarity, right, uh, evokes a positive response that makes them want to play again. So you get user retention and then you get monetization as a result, right? This is, it's just effective writing for that medium. That's the goal. So it's it's kind of important to have original music in that case because if you have production library music and it's not written just for the game, it doesn't have a brand, you don't have those effects, you have a game with music, but you could get a lot more out of it. Okay, so with with this, right, we I'm sure, you know, all of us are familiar with people coming to us and oh, at some point in our careers and saying, oh, I need a soundtrack, you know, uh, I need 10 minutes of music, right? I have a hundred bucks. No, I have a, okay, let's say I have a thousand dollars, right? You're not going to be able to get any good results from uh, most composers because the good ones will say no, right? And the the ones that say yes are not good, so you, you can't get a good result. So how do we get around this, right? Um, if you license tracks from music libraries, the cost per track is lower. Right, but what is missing from this equation that a composer would have provided is taste, right? And if we as music professionals, right, diversify our skill sets a little bit, not just to be creatives and create the music, but also to use our creative knowledge to decide what is effective and what is not effective, uh, we can kind of open up a new interesting industry for ourselves in consulting, right? Because maybe someone isn't in the market for your composing services, but they might be in the market for your services as a creative consultant. Because uh, depending on the budget, you know, if, if it's $5,000 uh, and they want 20 minutes of music, $250 per uh, minute of music, it's very low rate. But if you get a blanket license from a, from a production music library, a few thousand dollars, the other few thousand dollars goes to you for an hourly rate. You work from home. Everyone's happy because you're not getting underpaid for music. You're getting paid a decent rate for music supervision. It's kind of a just less hit on approach to the problem because the production music libraries are here to stay. So I'm preaching to the choir here, but this was meant for developers. When you develop a blueprint for, um, for a musical aesthetic, right? Let's, let's just say it's one track, right? And this is, this blueprinting method applies to one track. It can apply to uh, each of 10 tracks of uh, a whole set. And then it can apply also like in a, like an overarching way, you know, to the whole aesthetic. So it's important to get your clients, I think, uh, in my experience, to get to grips with what their high level needs are. Right, because if we if they go straight into we want to rock, uh, rock pop, <laughs> whatever, right, and they they don't know what result they're trying to achieve, 
right? And it's a lot easier for them to find out exactly what they want because uh, if they just go into genre and you're like, I can write that genre, and then you write that, and they be like, it's not right. But that's because they didn't get they didn't get their shit straight, right? They need to know what it is they want to achieve. So let's say, it's, this is uh, sorry, I'm a windbag, but let's say it's we want to evoke nostalgia and a kind of sweet sadness as the player experiences this sentimental coming of age story from the perspective of a young teenager. Raw and unsophisticated, but sincere and earnest. Nothing about music. Nothing. Right? And it's important that this is free of musical jargon, and we have to kind of empower our clients to speak without that, because it's our job to understand them. And then after that, uh, when, when you are ready to move on from the high level part, then you can, you know, de- uh, tackle whatever little details you have. You know, is it, it's set in China in the 1950s? Something like that. Uh, what what kind of music? What kind of political environment was that at the time, right? Uh, how how are we going to approach the stuff from that perspective? So, when you combine the two, you can very often drill down to exactly what is needed. So, if you wanted, you know, nineteen uh, twenties set in the Harlem Renaissance, right? Set in Harlem, right? I mean, obviously, you would have jazz, and you know, I mean, anybody could tell you that. You know, we need jazz for this, but what kind of jazz exactly, right? And with all of these, with all of these uh, examples, right? What is there is a commonality, right? Duke Ellington. So probably um, the client wants something along the lines of this composer, and I think this actually kind of frees you up to not be tied to the actual recording. But you can then use, dig into your knowledge of the composer, their history, uh, their development, and their techniques, and create something completely new that sounds like Duke Ellington without necessarily having to borrow too much from any of these three references. Right? It, it's a way of giving, giving yourself freedom. And of course, you would explain this to the client, but not in too much detail, because clients don't really like that much detail when it comes to music. They just want something that works. And uh, again, I must say that this is very much to do with uh, the kind of clients that I service, which generally casual. Generally, there's not a whole lot of story involved, right? So just keep it simple. Production music libraries are useful for testing, but um, where possible, of course, we would try to you know discourage clients from using them exclusively. For their games, because I mean, then we get into the area of why do you actually need a composer, right? I mean, and if a client is convinced that they can just use a production music library for their entire game and believe that uh, they are getting a good return on the investment, it probably means that they are not entirely sure why they would hire a composer in the first place. And I think as business people, it's our job to ex- our job to demonstrate and explain our value. The crux of all this is that what we are paid for is taste, right? We live in a time when you can press when you can press a button or two and have a epic trailer orchestra track without much effort produced at a, what non pros would probably consider to be a high level of production. So we can't sell ourselves on things like, oh, uh, I have the best orchestra libraries, right? I went to school and I learned how to write atonal music or something like that. It's, it's, it's really, it's about taste and about tailoring everything that we do to their expectations and their needs. And uh, I think if more composers could do that, they'd get paid, they'd get paid more. So certainly when we advise clients to use production music libraries in their prototyping or even in the final product, we're not advocating that they spend less on music Right. I mean, if we recommend that they use a library track, it's just so that they can free up um, the rest of it for a composer that will be paid their actual rate. So, you know, if you have like uh, the the example, uh, five thousand uh, five thousand dollars for twenty minutes of music, that sucks. But let's say you have most of it, um, most of it production music libraries, and then you have maybe one or two tracks by a composer who is being paid $1,000 a minute, which is not fantastic, but it's certainly respectful. 
you know, this they simply weren't in the mu- in the market for 20 custom minutes of music, right? But you would have preserved your rate, right? You would have given yourself some work as a music supervisor and you would be extremely valuable to this client because uh, you provided them the solution they would otherwise not have known about. And I think that this is kind of one of, this is important for us to remember as we dive into more and more technology that makes some of the skills that we thought would never become obsolete, obsolete, right? For example, I mean, there's the, the software, Elias, right? Um, the audio implementation software. When I saw it, I didn't see it as an implementation tool. Uh, how many of you are familiar with it, Elias? So just to, uh, for those who are not familiar, um, Elias is a, uh, is an audio implementation tool, much like Wise or FMOD, and uh, what you can use it for is to uh, transform uh, music according to certain uh, parameters that you set for it. And what I saw it as is something that I could use to generate endless, endless variations of my music. Because, I mean, the number of permutations, if you have five stems, that each of them are chopped up into four separate sections is a lot, right? So um, with tools like this available, I mean, being able to produce stuff very quickly is not even important anymore. It's not, it's not even a selling point anymore, right? I mean, it still is a little bit, right? But it's eventually going to go away because we're all, all of us uh, in every industry, whether it's the, um, in every industry, we're moving away from this factory model Right, because that used to be the efficient way to do it, but now we're moving away from that, and things like AI, things like uh, digital technology, are allowing us to do everything else. So, when we look to the future, we have to drill down really to what it is that is important about what we do. It's taste, right? Taste and understanding, understanding of human beings and understanding of why it is that you do what you do. These libraries certainly do have different forms of each track because uh, in advertising, you know, you have uh, you have a 15 second cut down, 30 second cut down, 60 second cut down. It probably doesn't loop, but uh, I'm sure if you put out a call for comp- compositions that loop um, to put into our library so that we can pay you 50% if anyone licenses it, we'll have a library <laughs> that, that has these things. Um, so currently, I'm not aware of uh, I'm not aware of any libraries that specialize in that. Although I spoke to the sales team at Firstcom, and they seem to be, uh, which is a subsidiary of Universal, uh, is it Universal or Warner? Uh, Universal, and uh, they seem to be very interested in getting into games. And I think it's only a matter of time because their executives are going to GDC uh, before they they start uh, offering products in that format. Um, do I see music being generated to be put into those libraries by AI? Certainly. Um, and in the future then, I mean, y- you would certainly be able to find any ukulele and glockenspiel library, uh, you know, like w- with like a million variations created by AI, but they all sound the same, so it doesn't matter. Um, I, I'm, I'm certain that's going to happen, and it's going to happen sometime soon because, I mean, uh, we've already had proven success of AI uh, deep learning programs that can uh, listen to all the Beatles songs and then come up with something that kind of sounds like the Beatles, but creepy. <laughs> but it's going to get there. It's going to get, it's it's so close. I think eventually it's going to get to that point. It's just a matter of whether they can reduce the CPU load and uh, the power consumption of creating a single thing. And once it gets lower, then it probably already is, the, the cost is probably already lower than, uh, you know, finding the Beatles. <laughs> The reason I see the music supervision role as growing is because in an information overload that we have, right, and information including intellectual property like music, um, because there's so much of it, what is greatly in demand and not enough of is curation, right? And uh, everything, everything, uh, like all the breakout um, apps and uh, important technologies, uh, a lot of them revolve around curation. Right, uh, whether it's crowd curated by ratings, right, or or something else, um, but definitely the music supervisor role is going to grow because uh, even actually even before libraries, right, there were music supervisors because they would 
they would still have to decide on the aesthetic and then hire the composer, source the musicians, etc. Right? But in the future, because all this stuff is available and there's just people are inundated with choice, people who don't know anything about music are going to rely on the expertise of those with trained ears to help them choose and decide what is what is good and what is not. But hopefully there will still be room for composers. There is nothing about a library like that unless it's using some proprietary technology that cannot be repeated by someone else. So, and then, I mean, it would be viable for a while because you'd be the first one doing it, but unless you patent the technology, I mean, someone else is going to do the same thing, have a bigger library with more stingers, with more customizations. Uh, but in the end, it's it's just a different a different kind of a form of a factory. Yeah, but uh, what will be viable is the company that supplies those libraries with the technology to do what they do. Well, thank you very much.